Some people were unhappy about my coming here, uh, possibly because they believe I'm a terrorist, they believe I'm a communist, they believe I'm a murderer. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> I'm what I am really. I'm just what I am. Good evening. My name is Zenge Ziwe Nsimang, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Oliver and Adelaide Tambo Foundation and your Program Director for this evening. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome you all here on behalf of the Chairman of the Oliver and Adelaide Tambo Foundation, Dr. Dumangosi, our trustees, as well as the Tambo family. The Oliver and Adelaide Tambo Foundation was established 10 years ago to promote preserve and protect the legacies of our patrons. In this period, we have dedicated our time and our resources to implementing community-based projects that inculcate the Tambo values of accountability, integrity, good governance, and ethical leadership. We have also brought you engaging speakers from civil society, government, and the private sector that speak truth to power and like Tambo are deeply committed to making our country and our continent a better place. 30 years have passed since Oliver Tambo returned to South Africa's shores in 1990. 
there are many who did not believe that the day would come that he, number one on the security branch's most wanted list, would return home. Oliver Tumbo, however, was not one of them. During his 27 years in exile, he said time and time again that he believed that South Africa would be free in his lifetime and that he would eventually return home. It was only three short years after he landed at what is now O.R. Tambo International Airport that Tambo passed away, ending a lifetime of struggle and a lifetime of triumph. He had done what the ANC's NEC had tasked him to do 60 years ago today by putting South Africa firmly on the road to democracy, though he passed away a year shy of our country's first elections. During Oliver Tambo's tenure, the ANC became the most recognized liberation movement in the world, and its incarcerated president, Nelson Mandela, arguably the most recognized political figure it globally. Ever the statesman, Tambo was instrumental in turning the global tide against the apartheid regime, putting immense pressure on the international community to implement sanctions amongst others, which eventually brought the regime to its knees and to the negotiating table. A wise woman once said, the goal is not to live forever. It is to create something that will. Tumbo understood this. And in hosting this event annually, we are trying to make sure that the Tumbo spirit truly lives forever by passing the values for which he stood values such as accountability, integrity, perseverance, and courage in the face of adversity to a younger generation. If we can create 10, 20, 30 little tumbos, young people who are ready to serve when called and do so in an exemplary manner, then our work will have been well worth it. In order to help us do just that this evening, it is my pleasure to introduce to you one of the first names that comes to mind when thinking about poetry in this country. Lebukhang Mashile. Mashile is an award-winning poet, author, presenter, actress, and producer. She is a household name in South Africa who is most recognized for her lyrical and gusty poetry, which has captivated audiences in 28 countries over the last two decades. Mashile is an award-winning author, presenter, and act actress. And this past Saturday, her award-winning play, which had been adapted into a movie, Venus versus Modernity, The Life of Sarki Bartman, screened at the Ake Arts Fe um, and Book Festival. Mashila has spent the last 20 years breaking barriers in the arts and culture world. A fierce and unapologetic feminist, a firebrand and a thought leader in her own right, Mashile was woke before most of us had ever heard of the term. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Ms. Lebukhang Mashile. Hello, can you see me? Can you hear me? Oh, should I? Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. Good evening, everybody. Um, it's my pleasure and my honor to be here. I am delighted to have the chance to lend my voice to an evening commemorating really um, two extraordinary African icons, um, Oliver Reginald Tambo, and of course, our keynote speaker this evening, Tizi Dangaremga. Um, I say this poem as an invitation and as an opening for the truths that will emerge this evening. After they fed off your memories, erased the dreams from your eyes, 
broken the seams of your sanity and glued what's left together with lies. After the choices and the voices have left you alone and the silence grows solid, adhering like flesh to your bones. They've always known your spirit's home lay in your gentle sway to light and substance, but jaded mirrors and false prophets have a way of removing you from yourself. You who lives with many names, you who walks with a million faces, none can eliminate your pain. Tell your story, let it nourish you, sustain you and claim you. Tell your story, let it feed you, heal you and release you. Tell your story, let it twist and remix your shattered heart. Tell your story until your past stops tearing your present apart. Thank you for that beautiful poem, Lebu. I consider myself to be youth adjacent, not quite as young as a youth, even by South Africa's very generous standards, but I am young enough to be able to relate to the urgency with which young people are demanding that they be allowed to lead and determine their own futures. There is something happening in the air. Young people are coming out in their droves to say, no, this is not what we signed up for. Be it in Nigeria, in Sweden, in the US, or here in Mzanzi, young people are demanding that their futures be placed in their own hands after suffering at the hands of rampant capitalism, of massive inequalities, social injustice, climate change, and violence. This, of course, is nothing new. History has shown us that it is the youth who bring about change in society. Revolutions have often been led by the youth. Tambo, Madiba, Sisulu, and their ilk changed the face of the revolution when they formed the ANC Youth League. And so there are lessons to be learned from the older generation, important lessons that can help us navigate our future. Alice Walker puts it perfectly when she says, look at the present that you are constructing. It should look like the future that you are dreaming. I am now going to hand over to, back to Lebu to do a formal introduction of Ms. Dangaremba. And finally this evening, our person of the week, Oliver Tambo, the president of the African National Congress. What is the difference that Oliver Tambo makes to the struggle? Tell me what you think are your strengths. My political strength, I think, lies in the truth. Um, I am simply what I am. I don't try to be anything else. You're described as a reluctant revolutionary. Is that just a cliche? Um, no, I, I think it is, uh, because uh, if, if being a revolutionary involves a fervent uh, desire and determination to see radical change, I am that. Ladies and gentlemen, our keynote speaker for this evening is Zizi Dangaremba. Siti Dangaremba is a Zimbabwean author, filmmaker, and activist who became the first Zimbabwean Black woman to publish a book in 1998 with her debut novel, Nervous Conditions, which was published when she was just 25 years old. The book is a modern classic in the African literary canon and was voted in the top 10 of Africa's 100 best books of the 20th century. The sequel, The Book of Not, was published in 2006 to much acclaim. 
Dangarembra also, also studied film direction in Berlin, where she was involved in the production of various narrative and documentary films, again breaking records. Her directorial debut, Everyone's Child, was the first feature film to be directed by a Black Zimbabwean woman. In 1993, Dangaremba wrote the story for the highest grossing film in the history of Zimbabwe, Neria. She founded the International Images Film Festival for Women in Zimbabwe. And in 2006, the independent named Dangaremba one of the 50 greatest artists shaping the African continent. Her third novel, This Mournable Body, a sequel to the Book of Not and Nervous Conditions, was published in 2018 and has been shortlisted for the 2020 Booker Prize. Dangaremba's work combines the politics of decolonization theory with issues of feminism and women's rights. In July 2020, Dangaremba was arrested for peacefully protesting against the corruption and economic hardships in Zimbabwe, and she is currently out on bail. Tonight, I've written a poem in honor of Titi Dangaremba, and the poem is addressed to Tambudzai. Um, if you are a lover of nervous conditions and this mournable body um, and the, the, this, the trilogy that of, of novels that, that Tsitsi has produced, you will know the character of Tambuzai quite well. Um, so I start. Dear Tambuzai, the men and women returned home, but they never came back from the battles. There is no pension plan for revolutionaries. No 12-step program for family turned to rubble. No one told the heroes that there are crumbs so big they fill up buildings in Dubai, ships, planes, and the insatiable arteries of the mined and milked earth. The only place Nahanda could keep safe from her captors was the long corridor of dreams in her mind. Our heroes gleam from black and white photographs stamped in your mouth, Tambuzai, when we believed they stood for us. The day after Chimurenga, the day after Lancaster House, when Nahanda saw them, she saw millions behind them. We believed they saw us too. Power is a two-way mirror. It pulls out who you know yourself to be. The bones of Gukuruhundi, Marikana, and AIDS babies are dancing, Tambuzai. They knew you before you knew yourself. When you said you are not a good girl, the bones grew spines of their own. Branches and leaves, they hold on to every rebel who has watched the collision of two worlds give birth to a border child. Your country was once named for a genocidal genius. His statue fell, but his company didn't. There remains a price on all of our heads. If you have loved a place that does not know how to love you back, you are an activist. Tambuzai, there is no home for those who love their countries enough to change their countries. There are prisons and footprints across nations like ORs. There is art where we make ourselves anew. The vision chiseled in the eye of the sculptor, the streets fed and healed by mothers, the post-colonial web of diplomacy, armed struggle, capitalism, democracy, kleptocracy, and state violence. If the state is failing now, then when has it succeeded? Your daughters have been coming, Tambuzai. They are here, burning on digital stakes, borderless, belting out. We don't know how to wait anymore. We encourage everyone who is watching this evening, please go on to our YouTube page where you're watching from and ask questions. We invite you to ask questions of our speaker. Um, also, if you haven't already, please share the YouTube link that you're watching on your other social media and invite other people to join us as well. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great, great, great pleasure to introduce to you, to welcome onto the stage, Ms. Tsitsi Dangaremba, to deliver the seventh 
annual Tambo lecture titled The Post-Crisis Crisis After Uhuru. Good evening and thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Lebo Mashile. It was absolutely mind blowing and thank you for speaking to Tambudzai. I'm sure Tambudzai and many young women like Tambudzai need to hear those words. Thank you for your wonderful poems, both of them. Good evening, Ms. Nsimang, CEO of the Oliver and Adelaide Tambo Foundation. Good evening, all members of the Tambo family and all present from the Oliver and Adelaide Tambo Foundation. Good evening, all guests. Thank you for joining this evening. It is my absolute pleasure and honor to deliver the seventh annual Oliver Tambo Memorial Lecture. Now, the brief sent to me by the foundation emphasized that Oliver Tambo practiced values-based leadership. And I think we saw that in the clips that were screened this evening. The brief also indicated that the foundation was established to promote, protect, and preserve the legacy of veteran freedom fighters and doyens of democracy, Oliver and Adelaide Tambo. It went on again to say that the foundation achieves these aims by undertaking education-focused community upliftment initiatives that seek to instill the values for which the Tambos stood into a new generation. It goes on to state, we believe that these values such as integrity, selflessness and collective servant leadership are critical in consolidating democracy. The topic I speak to is the post-crisis crisis after Uhuru. The questions I would like you to keep alive during this talk are, what kind of values are exhibited by the leadership we have now after Uhuru? Are these values that we see in our leadership today, the values that inspired this lecture series, that is the values of integrity, selflessness and collective servant leadership or not. I speak from the example of Zimbabwe. I am not an expert in any field except my own writing as a novelist, but I am familiar with the situation in Zimbabwe as a citizen who lives and works in my country. I hope my lay perspective will enlighten in some measure and I flatter myself that the foundation invited me to share this evening as a community voice and not as a specialist voice. I also flatter myself that while I speak to the situation in Zimbabwe, colleagues from South Africa and other African nations will find useful points of reference in what I have to say. I would like to look at the word Uhuru. Uhuru is a Kiswahili word, as I'm sure you all know. Originally, Uhuru meant freedom. During the 20th century independence movements and liberation struggles here on the continent, Uhuru came to mean political independence in the sense of being freed from former colonial rule and in some cases, colonial occupation. This is to say, there are two ways in which we can understand Uhuru. We can understand it in a specific sense, which refers to political independence, or we can understand it in a wider sense, which refers to a more general condition of freedom that is valued in and of itself without being measured against former colonial powers. Freedom can be understood as the power to think, speak, or act as one wants. Independence from colonial rule has been achieved. Thus, the crucial question in today's topic 
is whether now in a dispensation of political independence from colonial rule, citizens have the power to think, speak and act as they want. Following on from this is the question of whether observed degrees or amounts of freedom do or do not constitute a crisis. So to engage with these questions, I look at how freedom is framed in what I call Zimbabwean founding national discourse. I define certain indicators of freedom. I proceed to describe the situation in Zimbabwe today with respect to these indicators of freedom. I compare notions of freedom contained in the Zimbabwean founding discourse to what is actually obtaining on the ground. I evaluate the state response to the situation on the ground. What is the state doing about the situation of freedom that obtains on the ground? I make my conclusions concerning a post-Uhuru crisis. I propose that the founding discourse of Zimbabwe as a nation state is contained in the constitution of Zimbabwe. Chapter four of the constitution is the Declaration of Rights. This Declaration of Rights acknowledges the duty of the state and every citizen to respect human rights and freedoms. It lists 31 of these rights and freedoms which must be respected by all. These constitutional rights and freedoms indicate which parameters Zimbabweans in consensus when the constitution was written, agreed, give a desirable state of general freedom to citizens, a state in which citizens may think, speak and act as they want. These constitutional freedoms may be thought of as discursive rights and freedoms. This distinguishes them from practical rights and freedoms, which are in fact enjoyed by citizens on the ground. So, I want to see whether is a disc, there is a disconnect between what the constitution says and what is happening on the ground. From the 31 rights and freedoms contained in the constitution, I have extracted a list of those which appear to me to be most pertinent to this evening's topic. These are the right to life, to personal liberty, to human dignity, to personal security, to freedom from torture or cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment, to privacy, to freedom of assembly and association, to demonstrate and petition, freedom of expression and of the media, labor rights, political rights, property rights, the right to education, to healthcare, and to food and water. These discursive rights and freedoms from the constitution can be grouped into clusters. There are those which pertain to biological or physiological life, such as water, food, healthcare. There are those which pertain to community life, such as freedom of assembly. There are others which pertain to economic life and to political life. There are also those rights and freedoms which pertain to the security and dignity of the person. The categories do overlap somewhat, but grouping assists analysis. In Zimbabwe, independence was achieved through violent contestation for power in the form of an armed struggle as Lebo has informed us in her beautiful poem. At the same time, as it ushered in independence, violence also breached the security and disrupted 
the dignity of the person. Thus, political independence was ushered in by processes that violate a person's security and dignity. It is therefore instructive to compare the situation in Zimbabwe today with respect to dignity and security of the person with the situation that obtained at independence and which was endemic to that independence. And also to assess relative degrees of freedom with respect to security and dignity of the person today at times when power is contested the way it was being contested in the run up to independence. In this cluster of security and dignity, I include the right to life, to personal liberty, to human dignity, to personal security, to freedom from torture or cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. It is of course possible to do a similar analysis for all the other kinds of rights and freedoms, economic, political and so forth, but because of the way that these issues of security of the person and dignity of the person are integral to independence in Zimbabwe. It is these ones that I am going to look at to make the comparison between what we have today and what we had before independence. Zimbabwe's political independence from Great Britain became official on 18 April 1980. Leading up to independence was a protracted armed struggle between the settler Rhodesian community in the form of the Rhodesian state, which made a unilateral declaration of independence from Great Britain in 1965, and the military apparatus of this Rhodesian state. That is one side of it. And then on the other were the nationalist political structures and their armies, which were mostly exiled and which were informed by the ideologies of the then Eastern Bloc. The general objective of the Rhodesian military apparatus was to prop up the rule of Ian Smith in the newly independent white state of Rhodesia. The general objective of the nationalist political structures and their armies was to introduce majority rule. More specifically, according to Chingono, that is General Chingono, not the journalist. According to Chingono, the objective was attainment of black majority rule in an independent multiracial Zimbabwe, leading to equitable, distribution of wealth among its population. Land was at the center of ideas about wealth and wealth redistribution. The war began in 1967 and ended in 1979. Early in the war, casualties at the hands of the Rhodesian security forces were suffered mainly by black citizens and by the nationalist guerrillas. That is to say that the casualties of the war were generally amongst the black population and the guerrillas at the hands of the security forces. A change came about in 1972 when offensives in the Northeast launched by the Zimbabwe African National Liberation Army, Sanla, which was the military wing of the Zimbabwe African National Union, ZANU, began to be recorded. The Rhodesian regime reacted to the offensives and its increased casualties with a wide range of new procedures and new regulations and, and legislation. Protected villages, PVs, were set up. Setting up these PVs involved moving as many as 45,000 people at a time from their homes away to areas that the Rhodesian National Army could secure more successfully against guerrilla infiltration. So there were mass displacements of people at that time. 
the intention of the wide range of new regulations and legislation by the Rhodesian state after 1972 was typified by the Indemnity and Compensation Bill of 1975. The effect of this bill was to indemnify the Rhodesian security forces, including their mercenaries from various countries, for any action carried out while pursuing the security objectives of the Rhodesian state. That is to say that members of the Rhodesian security forces were secured against any legal liability in advance for any action whatsoever that they performed in service of the Rhodesian state, which they might carry out at any time in the future. Special courts to try those said to be working against it in the war effort were also set up by the Rhodesians. Virtually any opposition to the Rhodesian regime was indictable and some writers have noted that the courts were very close to being kangaroo courts. The tactics of the 50 to 80% Black Special Forces Regiment, the Salu Scouts, is worthy of note. Maxi, in an outline of the armed struggle in Zimbabwe, writes, according to interviews with Rhodesian army deserters by the World Council of Churches, the scouts go into a village pretending to be guerrillas and get food and information. They are followed shortly after by the regular army who interrogate the villagers. When they leave, the scouts return, accuse the villagers of giving information to the army as if they were true guerrillas, and then the scouts half destroy the village. As a result, it becomes difficult for the villagers to know who they are talking to and what they should say to who. It is important to, here to see that villagers were affected by these tactics of both physical and psychological violence. At the same time, it is generally accepted that nationalist guerrillas killed more black civilians than they killed either Rhodesian security forces or white Rhodesians and even the two combined. It is said that one reason for guerrilla use of extreme violence against black Zimbabweans was to punish traitors and anyone who collaborated with the Rhodesian regime. Another reason was to overcome the disincentive of Rhodesian retribution because Rhodesian vengeance strongly inhibited the people from expressing their political support, even though this is what the people felt for the guerrillas. So the guerrillas had to overcome this inhibition that was caused by Rhodesian retribution and punishments. Guerrilla violence was thus a tactic to overcome fear of Rhodesian reprisal and the attraction of rewards the Rhodesian regime offered through instilling into the majority population a fear of consequences of non-cooperation with the nationalist effort, which was far greater than the fear which the black majority felt for the Rhodesian regime and its army. A very important tactic there, the tactic of instilling fear of consequences of non-cooperation by the guerrillas. And thus we see in the case of the guerrillas also a mixture of physical and psychological violent tactics. In terms of displacement of individuals, school children from several institutions were abducted to join the nationalist war effort. Thus, at the time of political independence, 
one of the meanings of Uhuru. At the time of political independence, Zimbabwe had a violent outgoing state. It also had a violent formation as incoming state. Both of these entities had pursued their objectives through practices of violence, which were used to subdue and instill fear in citizens. There was an incoming political framework called majority rule, which was informed by ideas about wealth, wealth redistribution, land possession, and the black vote as the hallmarks of success of the armed struggle. Marxist rhetoric underpinned a focus on material possession and class. Other rising nationalistic rhetoric informed a focus on race with the logical extension of this flowing into tribal rhetoric focused on ethnicity. Military rhetoric centered on conflict antagonism and enmity. The discursive legacy of the armed struggle is one of preoccupation with acquisition of material wealth, expropriating and sanctioning groups said to be other, and also a preoccupation with enemies who work to undo what the armed struggle effected. Clearly, the discursive legacy of the armed struggle is diametrically opposed to the discursive freedoms governing the right to personal security and dignity prescribed in the constitution of Zimbabwe. Glaringly absent in the armed struggle rhetoric which informed the new Zimbabwean state are ideas about the nation state and ideas about those who together constitute the nation state, that is the citizens. Individuals do not inform any of this rhetoric. Rather, as was the case during the armed struggle, individuals with hopes, needs, desires and, and aspirations are disembodied into one mass of existence whose sole purpose is to enable the agenda of those who are in power to succeed. Zimbabwean existence becomes a never ending contestation for power. To those in power, Zimbabwe was never and is not a nation of several million persons whose existence it must be secured and dignified. Rather, it is a location in which politico-military desires are to be met. To the extent that any nation building values were invoked, these values were intended to service the politico-military machinery, which did not at any time see itself in service to or bound by such nation building values. I now want to inquire which discourse, whether the violent otherizing discourse of the liberation struggle or the freedom guaranteeing discourse of the constitution has informed state interaction with its citizens in the post-political independence era. The evidence is that violent actions have been perpetrated against citizens in significant measure following independence. Notably, these incidents of violence flare up during times of heightened political tension, such as elections, or the formation of a new party when power distribution is at stake. Complaints of intimidation and torture were made during the independence election period in 1980, as far back as then. Following the war and the brutality surrounding the 1980 elections, violence continued with the 1983 to 87 
Kukarahundi genocide in Matabeleland in the south. The situation improved somewhat in the 1990s. This improvement followed the signing of the Unity Accord, which ended the Matabeleland genocide. With this Unity Accord, ZANU-PF engulfed and contained the Zimbabwe African People's Union, ZAPU. ZAPU being largely, but not entirely correctly, seen as an Ndebele ethnic grouping. After the 1990s, violence escalated again in 2000. This violence followed the formation of the Movement for Democratic Change, MDC, the previous year. The rejection of the government's draft constitution in February of 2000, then the elections in March and conflicts around land reform. This all happening early in 2000 and generating violence. The presidential elections of 2002 contested by incumbent Robert Mugabe of ZANU-PF and Morgan Changirai of NDC as front runners saw another escalation in violence. That's now 2002. In 2005, parliamentary elections were preceded by Operation Murambachina, Operation Refusal of Dirt, which destroyed the homes and or livelihoods of 700,000 urban citizens and displaced over 2 million more, the urban centers being seen as NDC strongholds. Alex Magaisa tells us unprecedented levels of state-sponsored violence in which 200 people were killed, 5,000 more were assaulted, and 36,000 were displaced, took place between the end of March and June 27, 2008. This violence, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> so that was violence taking place between the end of March and June 27, 2008. This violence was associated with the presidential election, also contested by Robert Mugabe and Morgan Changirai as the front runners. Less than a decade later, the violence invaded ZANU-PF itself with events that led to the coup of November 2017. Talking about these events from 1980 to 2017, this is only some of the violence, the violent incidents that were recorded. Um, it's not possible to give a comprehensive account of these incidents in the short time that we have today. Following 2017, the Zimbabwe Human Rights NGO Forum informs that organized violence and torture has increased in Zimbabwe since November 2017. There were 24 abductions, that is kidnappings of citizens, said to have been affected by state agents in 2018. In 2019, there were 67 alleged abductions. This year, 15 abductions have been reported, 11 of them in connection with the July 31 protest. The abductions are typically said to be accompanied by beatings and torture. Some forms of torture are alleged to be physical, while others are said to be degrading, designed to break a person down and to deprive a person of dignity. Together, the foregoing instances make 106 incidents in which the right of Zimbabwean citizens to liberty was breached and the right to freedom from torture and demeaning treatment was infringed upon in the three years since the coup. These cases are some of the most extreme which have occurred.
Sources report many other instances of beatings and infringement of the right to personal security in this time since 2017. And in addition to this, 25 extrajudicial killings are alleged since November 2017. The outcomes of the above acts of violence have all favored the retention of ZANU-PF in the offices of state. This raises the strong suspicion that the governing party, which styles itself the ruling party, has a hand in the violence in order to maintain its hold on power. Nevertheless, it is conceivably arguable and the Zimbabwean authorities have used this argument in the past, that the modes of violence described this evening do not emanate from the ZANU-PF controlled state, but from some other entity. A test of this cont contention lies in the reaction of the Zimbabwean state to the violence. How does the Zimbabwean state react? Does it act to protect and secure its citizens? Does the Zimbabwean state give citizens recourse when their rights are infringed in such violent manner? What does the state do? In a presentation on the topic, the scourge of state-sponsored abductions, arbitrary arrests, torture and violence in Zimbabwe, how to stop it now. Tony Reeler pointed out that there has been impunity following all these instances of violence. Reeler describes a post-independence 40 year long cycle of violence followed by impunity. Impunity was inscribed into the very structure of the newly forming Zimbabwean state in 1979 by virtue of the Zimbabwe Amnesty Act, which provides no legal proceedings whatsoever, whether civil or criminal, shall be instituted in any court of law in respect of any act to which this section applies, done within Southern Rhodesia or elsewhere before the 21st of December, 1979. That meant that all the brutality and violence and the atrocities of the liberation struggle were simply washed away as though they had not taken place. That there was no such thing as a war crime with respect to the liberation struggle. The 1979 Zimbabwe Amnesty Act was followed in 1980 by the Amnesty General Pardon Act, which provided a free pardon is hereby granted to every person in respect of any act committed by him being an act which constitutes a criminal offense to which this act applies. With this act, in 1980, those who perpetrated violence around the 1980 elections were granted impunity. Mandikwaza tells us that both these acts of 1979 and 1980, which granted impunity and erased all war crimes, formed part of the Lancaster House Agreement, which ended the armed struggle and which agreement was brokered by Great Britain. Clemency order number one of 1988 followed the unity accord between ZANU-PF and ZAPO, which had been signed 18 months earlier. It granted amnesty with respect to all human rights violations committed by the state security forces and so-called dissidents between 1982 and the end of 1987. This act exonerated 
all those who had been involved in the Gukurahundi genocide. Clemency order number one of 1995 was issued after the general elections of that year in response to violence around the general elections in the year. In 2000, President Mugabe's clemency order number one of 2000 gave free pardon to every person liable to criminal prosecution for any politically motivated crime committed during the period 1 January 2000 to 31 July 2000. Rape, murder and fraud were accepted, but those who committed these accepted crimes were not seriously pursued. Clemency order number one of 2002 covered acts of violence in the run-up to the presidential election of that year so that there were no prosecutions. Now, in addition to amnesties for widespread violence that flared up at election time and other critical moments, clemency was also granted to state-aligned agents who participated in acts of violence upon individuals or smaller groups. Edward Kanengoni and Kizito Chibamba were tried and convicted of attempted murder of Patrick Kombai in 1990. Kombai was contesting the general election in Gweru under the banner of Zimbabwe Unity Movement, ZUM, against ZANU-PF. The attack was carried out three days before the election day. Kombai was shot and nearly killed. The two were apprehended and tried, but released when Robert Mugabe exercised his presidential pardon. Now, there are two kinds of impunity. Impunity may be official through direct legislation or pardon as described above, and impunity may be unofficial through failure of the state to arrest and prosecute perpetrators. I now give a few examples of unofficial impunity where the state failed to pursue, arrest and prosecute perpetrators. And I'm going to begin by talking about cases where the violence was perpetrated upon individuals. And then I will go on to give one example of more widespread violence. So with respect to where violence was perpetrated on individuals, human rights defender, Jessina Mukoko was abducted in 2008. Her abductors admitted in the civil court that the abduction had occurred. They were ordered to pay compensation, but there was no action from the state. Activist Itai Zamara was abducted in 2015, never to be heard of again. The motor vehicle used for the abduction and its owner were traced, but the state took no action. More recently, those involved in the abduction of Joanna Mamombe, Cecilia Chimbiri and Netsai Maroa who were abducted after an MDC demonstration on May 13 this year, have not been pursued by the state. Rather, the three women have been charged with faking an abduction and are to face trial. Tawanda Muchehiwa was abducted on 30 July this year in Bulawayo. CCTV footage of the event enabled the car involved to be tracked to Impala Car Rentals in Harare. Impala Car Rentals has been directed to hand over relevant data by the court, but has not done so. Now, um, to talk a little bit about un unofficial impunity for widespread violence. The Global Political Agreement of 2008 
which ended violence associated with contestations between ZANU, PF and NDC in that year, is an example of unofficial impunity for widespread violence. While an institution to deal with national healing and reconciliation was formed as a result of the global political agreement, there was consensus among the three major Zimbabwean political parties that signed the agreement that there would be no processes of justice involving perpetrators or for affected citizens. It is worthy of note that this agreement was brokered by former South African President Thabo Mbeki. Magaisa indicates that official agreements which ended widespread violence in Zimbabwe, such as the Lancaster House Agreement, the Unity Accord, and the Global Political Agreement are top-down elite processes, which should not take into account the wishes and needs of the ordinary citizen. Instead, these elite pacts leave the ordinary citizens without justice, recourse, or rehabilitation and psychologically burdened. Impunity also extends to other crimes. For example, in 1989, a presidential pardon was given to Frederick Schauer, who was convicted of perjury for lying to a commission investigating large scale corruption. In issuing the pardon, Mr. Mugabe said, who amongst us has not lied? Yesterday, you were with your girlfriend and you told your wife that you were with the prime minister. Should you get nine months for that? These words indicate a male supremacist, casual attitude to justice that has come to characterize Zimbabwean culture, the Zimbabwean state and Zimbabwean politics. Today, Frederick Schauer is Zimbabwe's permanent representative to the United Nations. I come now to my conclusion. From the above, it is clear that Zimbabwean citizens' right to life, to personal liberty, to human dignity, to personal security, to freedom from torture or cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment is not respected by the Zimbabwean state. Other objectives are more important to the state machinery. Therefore, the state does not intervene to stop or remedy such violations when they occur. And there is strong evidence that the state is complicit in the acts through the ZANU-PF governing party. It is clear that under the threat attendant upon cycles of violence and impunity, Zimbabweans cannot think, act, or speak as they want. Thus I conclude Zimbabwean citizens do not enjoy freedom in the general sense of Uhuru after political independence, that is the narrow sense of Uhuru. I did intend to look at the definition of crisis and discuss whether such a situation in which Zimbabweans do not enjoy freedom in the general sense of Uhuru could, said to con could be said to constitute a crisis or not. However, time is limited. I end with this. While the Zimbabwean state argues that there is no crisis in Zimbabwe, as a community voice, I argue that where a population is subjected to repetitive cycles of violence, which repeatedly violate discursive freedoms guaranteed under the constitution, there is a nation state in crisis. Clearly, the values which inform the Oliver and Adelaide Tambo Foundation, the values of integrity, selflessness, and collective servant leadership are not observed in such a situation. 
democracy cannot thrive and is actively, willfully abandoned in such a context. I hope that as engagement with the Zimbabwean situation unfolds in Zimbabwe, in the region, on the continent and internationally, increasing attention will be given to what can concretely be done peacefully to end this crisis, which affects millions of people, even if it does not affect a very small percentage of political military elites in Zimbabwe. I had prepared some pointers on this, but again, time eludes me. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Titsi, for that extremely powerful and informative lecture where, as you are known to do, you pulled absolutely no punches. Uh, I think it was an important analysis, particularly given the linkages that have always been drawn between Zimbabwe and South Africa politically, particularly where we are in our, revol in, in our revolutions or post-revolutions. Um, now, I'm going to move over and jump straight in and start asking you questions. Our YouTube questions have been flowing in, so I just want to get straight to it um, and ask you the first question, which is from Akona uh, Nugande. She says, Uhuru seems to forget women's participation in Uhuru movements. Maybe we'll see a post Uhuru, hoping that they don't kill us all. How do you uh, think that we can concretize the role of women in healing nations? Yes, uh, the role of women is really significant. And uh, you will notice that I slipped in one crime there, which was not really a crime of violence, but I put it in because I wanted to insert the issue uh, of gender into this discourse, where um, a minister, Frederick Schauer, uh, perjured uh, himself in court and was given a pardon by uh, Robert Mugabe, who said that you, everybody lies, you lied to your wife, that you were with the prime minister, but you were with your girlfriend. So straight away, we see that, that there really was a gender dimension to the armed struggle and that the men who were in the armed struggle generally could not have been said to be particularly um, emancipated, many of them, as indicated by Robert Mugabe's words. I think that women have to take the space for themselves. We cannot wait for this space to be given to us. Our societies in, on the continent tend to be very conservative and they militate against us. And because of the economic problems, the problems of livelihood, we are often loath to stand up and speak. And really having had the experience that I had of being in prison for one night. I really understand now why people are loath to stand up and speak. But my contention remains until women engage as women for themselves and for the wider society, we will remain silent. We will remain unseen. We will remain erased. And so it, it really is up to us. So for every woman who has that question about what about the women, my response would be, okay, what can you do yourself, however little? How can you join up with one or two other women and do something, you know, in your context that is relevant to your context? And that is the way we have to go. Thank you so much for that, Titsi. My next question is uh, from Moteo Brody. And uh, Mateo asks, in the Zim context, how can freedom loving people across the world best offer solidarity to the resistance and struggle waged by the average Zimbabwean person? And secondly, do you think sanctions against Zimbabwe are useful? Okay, for the first one, solidarity. I think solidarity can be talking to people um, within your circle, it can be on social media, it can be following Zimbabweans and encouraging them, it can be looking out for initiatives. There are so many citizen 
initiatives now that are looking for funding on GoFundMe and other platforms, I think it requires a little bit of active inquiry. One can even tweet and ask, uh, are there any citizens initiatives? What are they? I'd like to know, maybe I could get involved with some. And then to spread the word in your own communities and to encourage people also uh, to support those initiatives. Um, uh, some of the countries, for example, Great Britain, still um, the United States, still have a lot of influence. So they're again lobbying with the representatives, political representatives in one's country um, is very important. We have at the moment one of several PR firms that are hired by uh, the Zimbabwean state uh, to um, improve its image. And one of them is Mercury. That is the one that they have been using most recently. One can write to them and tell them to stop taking uh, money from states who have not sorted out their relationship with their citizens. These are all things that people can do. Now, the second one was about sanctions. Do sanctions, please would you read it again, Zeng, so that I can get it properly. Um, okay. Uh they let me just get it it was um are sanctions um effective it was that simple are sanctions um effective um in zimbabwe it was that simple yes i think sanctions are effective because sanctions do say that this is a state that we should be looking at to find out what is going on here so I think to, to that extent that they raise an alarm and allow people to understand that there is something that is wrong, sanctions are effective. There are other dimensions to the sanctions debate. Do they affect ordinary citizens? Of course they do. Um, but in terms of whether they are effective or not, they are effective. Important here is the question of who is affected most is it the ordinary citizen who is affected most? Is it those political, military, uh, economic elites uh, who are affected less than ordinary citizens? That's something that I really don't have an answer to, but I think it's a critical discussion at the same time. And I'm glad you didn't ask me whether sanctions should be removed, but to answer your question, are they effective? I say, yes, they, sanctions are part of a whole range of tactics that can be used to, to highlight the situation in Zimbabwe and, and to exert some pressure for positive change. Thanks so much for that, Titsi. I've got a question from you that uh, for you that is from Mia Swart. And Mia says, South Africa grapples with a similarly violent history and legacy. How does a nation break free from violence and how can Zimbabweans best resist um, violence? Breaking free from violence is really a very difficult thing to do. And when the violence was as widespread as in the case of Zimbabwe, and when it affected uh, such large numbers of people in these psychological ways where the, <coughs> excuse me, the, the violence was calculated to induce terror, we have now um, a society that is in psychological disarray. And we also need to remember that those people who now constitute the Zimbabwean state were also most of them uh, victims of violence from the Rhodesian state themselves. So we have a society that really is psychologically burdened from top to bottom. So my response to that would be, we need to engage at those psychological levels. What can be done at the national psychological level? We were meant to have healing um, programs in Zimbabwe after the liberation struggle. They didn't happen for one reason or another. It is said that monies for the programs were, um, were simply stolen. But then again, it, it was that Marxist rhetoric that never spoke about the individual, because when you talk about healing, you're talking about healing the individual. So if you don't acknowledge the individual as a unit of society, but you have classes as the unit of society, you are not going to be concerned with that individual healing that needs to be done. But this is where we need to go. 
And in fact, uh, Zimbabwe is beginning to see this now because the idea of uh, mental illness is something that we are beginning to talk about openly. The taboo uh, is being broken down and there are more and more organizations that are engaging with the kinds of services that are necessary. And I think this is a good thing. But then there are also societal level modes of healing, which really are the arts. That is one of the function of the arts, to engage with trauma, to bring it up into the public space in a way that, it, that, that uh, the public can engage with and, and to open up the debates around these things. And then of course, there, there are the, the, the political um, uh, kind of uh, transitional justice uh, mechanisms. You had one in South Africa, uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, we didn't have one at all in Zimbabwe. As you heard, all we had were clemencies and pardons for the people who are part of it. So these are all things that have to be done, but they have to be done consistently. If we look, for example, at the trauma that was um, <clears throat> felt by, <coughs> excuse me again, the trauma that was felt by the USA after Vietnam, we still have narratives about Vietnam. That is the coming to terms. You know, as, as it is with an individual, when an individual goes through trauma, you, you, you tell your story again and again, and you're always looking for people to listen and, until you feel that you've come to the end of it. So it is with bigger groups, communities, and nations, and we need to go through that process. Thanks. Um... Uh, Titsi, I want, I've got a question from you that is from Nikiwa Bikicha, and she has said a bit of a question and a comment. Um, she said, what hope for the democratic state if impunity is ingrained and fear govern, governs the relationship between the state and its citizens? Yeah, that, that is a very big question. We, we need more initiatives from citizens who have understanding of these issues. And engagement has to move away from purely political engagement. Because when we talk about political formations, we are simply operating in the realm of power. But we have to come out to operate in the realm of nation, in the realm of community, in the realm of the individual. And so initiatives by citizens have to understand that and begin a bottom up process of transformation. That is the only hope in my opinion. <clears throat> Engaging at the level of power will do nothing but substitute one form of power for another form of power in an oppressive and violent structure, which is what we saw happen at independence. And, and in terms of voting, I know there's a lot of South Africans that are going to be listening to this answer very carefully. The question is from Vlaudi Karlsa, and they've asked, is voting out ZANU the only way to undo the legacy of violence? There are two parts to that. I do not believe that ZANU-PF is able to reform itself from a violent institution. And this is not entirely their fault. They were formed in violence to be violent in order to attain freedom. So it is in their DNA. And I haven't seen that moment of break that informs me that anything else is possible out of that DNA. I haven't seen it. I hope I am going to be beautifully surprised, but um, <laughs> I'm waiting. So I, I do not believe that ZANU-PF can reform itself, which would mean that it would be very difficult to, to achieve peace with ZANU-PF um, at the helm. Voting them out is then the only option that we have. And we have to see how we can nurture the institutions of democracy as citizens and also increase our understanding and capacity and ability to confront unpleasant and fearful truths in order to make that happen. I believe that there has been rigging. Um, there, there are cases where rigging was blatant, where it was actually recorded that an MDC incumbent, uh, an MDC um, candidate had won, but yet 
a ZANU PF candidate was declared the winner and is became the incumbent. But I believe that this kind of rigging can only happen where there are sufficient numbers already. So I would say it is true that there are very many people who for one reason or another, whether it's because of fear, whether it's because of the nationalist rhetoric, whether it's because of the freebies, you know, the chicken in or the couple of kgs of rice, whatever, but there are people who do support and vote for ZANU-PF. And, and so um, we have to get to a stage where we can change that in sufficient numbers for it to be impossible for the percent of rigging to actually change results. Thanks for that response. Now, I, I have two more questions because we're running out of time. I have lots more questions, uh, but I have two more questions for you. And one is from Swaziland. Um, and Nokwanda Jamini is asking, are there any lessons for a country um, where the violence is more subtle? Um, Eswatini being an example, which is a peaceful monarchy, but violence prevails daily in different shapes and forms? Yes, that's a very good question. And in fact, we have that in Zimbabwe too, but I opted to take the bigger picture because of uh, the link to Uhuru, which is what we were talking about. I think it, the engagement would be the same. It's about community mobilization. It's about expanding consciousness. It's about finding citizen agency to stand against that violence and not to be intimidated. It is very, very difficult for us because we are still very conservative and traditional in our thinking. And therefore we tend to bow down to authority. But this is where really, uh, as Zeng Simang was saying, the youth need to stand up because the youth have had a different socialization. And so, of course, the older generation will tell the youth, no, don't do that. But the youth should not listen. The youth should take what they know to be their truth from where they are standing and run with it. I am an advocate for peace. And I believe that you cannot create peace out of violence. We have had those violent times. It is now time to create from peace. And, and this is what I think that the youth um, really need to be seized with. Now, just before we wrap up, I'm going to ask you a question um, that is more uh, personal. And it is about you asking, um, you have known both extreme success and extreme derision for your work and your views throughout your career. Do people's reactions matter to you anymore? Who is your imagined audience and how do you gouge the effectiveness of your work amidst the clamor of people's reactions? <laughs> Thank you, yes. Yeah, so people's reactions do matter to me because that is my bread and butter. If no one likes what I do, I won't eat. <laughs> so people's reactions do matter to me. But um, obviously I've been eating because here I am. So within that context, I write for Africa to begin with. Um, I have been writing up until now very specifically for African women. And I still do because I think that we need to affirm ourselves as, as a group of people, a demographic. This goes back to the first question. We need to affirm ourselves and to see ourselves and be able to tell each other, yes, I see you as an African woman. I think that is the only thing that will release our strength. So that is who I write for uh, as my first audience. And from there, it goes out to other African people and the rest of the world, because I don't want to exclude anybody, even though I know who I am specifically writing for. Um, and so for me, when that audience of African women like my literature, I feel validated. 
really. And when other people do not, I can say to myself, well, I did this for these people and they like it. And so that is fine. And to be very honest, um, that has been the case. I have had complete support, recognition and understanding from those African women who have seen themselves in the literature. And that has sustained me. Thank you so, so much for delivering the seventh annual Oliver Tumble Memorial Lecture. We're so pleased that you could join us this evening. We really are, Titi, we're completely humbled. It's been wonderful to have you. And I think we've gotten a fresh perspective on something that is so very important. I think as I wrap up this evening, I just want to thank everyone for joining us. For uh, The Tumble Foundation is so pleased that you could make it this evening. Uh, on Friday, we'd like you to join us again because we have another installment in this in our lecture series, and that will be Professor Pumla Rola. So please do join us on Friday evening. Um, and I would also like to take this opportunity to thank the Tambo team that put this event together. Uh, 2020 has been an extremely difficult year for all of us, all of us in the country, all of us in the world. And I'm extremely um, proud of the all female, all youth team that I have that have put this together this evening. So thank you once again, everyone for joining us. I hope to see you on Friday evening. Follow at Tumble Foundation for more information about our next event and those that are coming, including a lecture by former president Jakaya Kikwete on the 30th of November. Thank you once again and have a wonderful evening and we'll see you on Friday. What I personally would be certain of is that under the leadership of an Oliver Tambo, you wouldn't have the kind of divisions that the ANC has been experiencing. Oliver Tambo's character would have been his force of example under current conditions that would have discouraged some of the tendencies that we're experiencing today. That is something that we need to take from his life. We can learn as young people that leadership is not about being elected, about just thumbing, is about what comes out of you, what it is that you put into society for a better life. And OR was that kind of a person.